Uh, first talk is by Ofer Lahav uh, from the University College of London, and he will talk about deep versus shallow learning in cosmological surveys. So thank you very much, Ofer, and the floor is yours. I'll give you a warning uh, three minutes uh, before the time. Thank you very much. I hope you, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I will share the screen. Can you see it all right? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, good. Well, hello from London. Sorry I cannot be there in person. Thanks very much to the organizers for this very stimulating and timely meeting. Uh, the scope of the meeting as, as came about in various discussions is, do we need machine learning at all? Personally, I think that, you know, there's no way back. I think we are there with machine learning to stay. But I think there is the question of what kind of machine learning. So I want to, to ask the general question about deep versus shallow learning and to give a few examples to motivate that discussion. Uh, the outline of this talk is really essentially to ask the question, what's the gain? What's the delta as we go from the traditional uh, methods of uh, machine learning? And the definition of shallow and learning, you know, is a bit ambiguous. But I mean to say by shallow, the old fashioned ways of, of putting, doing feature extraction and putting only a few layers compared with what started in 2015 or so is deep learning. And then comes the question, okay, even if you're very happy with, uh, with machine learning, with deep learning, uh, you know, could you actually understand or explain or interpret it? Of course, all that many people in the audience, including myself are involved in various long-term projects of imaging. Some of them are listed here. Uh, so this is the motivation, but I'd like to mention three uh, studies that were done led by students here at UCL in a program called CDT. And uh, the first one is about explainable AI, XAI for galaxy morphology led by uh, Prab uh, Bambra together with Benjamin Joachimi. And in fact, our uh, preprint just appeared today on the archive. So well, you're welcome to look at it and comment. And then earlier papers by another student called Ben Hendres, uh, where we looked at photos that from full images and also an issue which I think is just developing now of benchmarking and scalability. I mentioned CDT, so just to say a few words, I think it's appropriate for this audience. Uh, we don't only have to ask, you know, how to do machine learning in, in the future, but also how do we train the next generation of scientists because I think they have to be trained in a different way than our older generation uh, got trained. So at UCL, we started five years ago, a program called CDT, Center for Doctoral Training in Dental Intensive Science. In fact, we have now five cohorts. The last one just started and the, the very first, some of them are graduating now, altogether 52 PhD students. And it's a four year program. And uh, in, in the various discussions yesterday, people talked about industry leading the way. The, our students actually are spending six months of the four year program actually working at an AI uh, company. So there's a very good cross fertilization between the industry and, and university and also it prepares them for a dual career. We have a spin off activity with Jordan, but that's uh, something for another time. Uh, I, I see you, you'd see there um, a few uh, you know, of those 52, uh, uh, several I think already are at a meeting and gave talks, for example, David de Piras, uh, but those five over there, uh, Constantina, Ben, Sunil, Prab, and Joshua are my students, students I supervise or co-supervise. So this is just a quick introduction and I'll show results from work with Ben, Andrews, and uh, Prab Bamba. Uh, okay, so I think most people are practitioners of, of this subject. Uh, just, it, you know, there's not only an explosion of the number of papers on, on, deep, on, on machine learning in general, but specifically on deep learning. I looked up deep learning in the title and the archive, and you can see we're at the level that uh, someone in the world 
writes a paper with deep learning in a title every once or twice a week, okay? Uh, now, as, as you all know, the old way of doing it was to extract features from an image, feed it into a shallow network, what we call now shallow, and tell whether it's a car or not a car. In deep learning, we feed in the whole image. Okay, so this was the breakthrough. And computer scientists tell me that, you know, they still don't quite understand why is it that deep learning is working so well. There are some papers about it, uh, but I think there's still no textbook solution why deep learning is working so well. Uh, so the question, what's the delta? The other comment I'll make is somewhat historical. Uh, several times people said yesterday, you know, the subject started really being serious in 2015 with deep learning, just to say that, you know, uh, some have, some of us made our attempts already in the early 1990s. I think my own, my first uh, machine learning paper with for galaxies is from 92, 1992, last century, sorry. Uh, and, and this was an attempt where we actually had, you know, low, low tech, 80, 840 images from the APM, six gurus of the time, and we managed to reproduce type to two units on the Devocular system. Devocular, by the way, was one of the experts alongside John Hukra uh, 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 and others. And later we also expanded it for Galaxy Zoo. Now, thing on, on the archive led by uh, first, well, it's now second year uh, CDT student, uh, Prab Bambra, together with Benjamin Joachimi, as co-supervisor. And what we tried is to really go to that level of understanding what is it in a galaxy image that makes one decide about a feature. So we use the Galaxy Zoo, which as you know, members of the public classified, so there's a distribution of classes and so on. And we produce what's called a saliency map or, or heat map, maybe you may like that. So that's the original image on the left. And these are features which represent structure that this procedure called smooth grad can tell us what it is. Essentially, it's taking derivative of the output, the score per class with respect to the pixel intensity. So if you like, you try to analyze what all these many, many human eyes have done or human brains have done by this very simple derivative. You have to smooth it a bit to improve performance. It's all in the paper. But the nice thing is if you do it with respect to bar, you really see a bar most of the times. There are also some deviations, bulge, spiral arms, and so on. And what Prab has done here is not only identify the bar, but also to actually plot the size of the bar on that heat map compared with the bar as measured by by humans, okay? And you see there's a very tight correlation, correlation coefficient of about 0.76. So for us, it's a nice, I think it's a nice step of things we hopefully will see in the future of actually understanding what is it that, what's happening in classification and through these heat maps, it's, it's a way also to measure parameters, a bunch of risk ratio and so on in a way which is more objective. Uh, and what's also another comment is in this technique, we actually bypass all the complicated internal architecture of the network. As you know, people tried a lot to analyze weights of a neural network and so on. We tried many years ago. It's very complicated. This is a much cleaner way of doing it. Okay, photometric redshifts, this audience needs a little introduction to that, but just a reminder, you observe the sky in four or five filters, for example, in Sloan or, or uh, Dark Energy Survey, and the same galaxy if puts in different ratios will have different amounts of fluxes. And it's an inverse problem going from the fluxes or the magnitude to the redshift. When I first heard about it long time ago, I thought, oh, it's only a problem for one afternoon. But here we are 20 years later, still working on it. And of course, it's absolutely crucial, as you know, for LSST, uh, uh, Euclid. And as we heard this morning from Elizabeth Krauss in, in Dark Energy Survey, uh, we spent many years actually on PhotoZ. At the time, we came up with the neural net approach, NNZ and NNZ2, which uh, has done, I think, a reasonable job, but there are now a dozen or so other methods. Uh, we also heard about ideas combining. Uh, you have three uh, minutes uh, left, sorry. Yeah, fine, thank you. Uh, so th th there's an, an interesting step here, which was actually led by a group uh, from the IAP and Marseille, Pasquet, Bertin, Treyer, and others, is to actually 
not just to extract magnitude within a circle on the image or something equivalent, but to look at the whole image, right? So this is was kind of a inter very interesting step. And as we can see, Z fought against Z spec, uh, that's the standard me method of, of just feature extracting five numbers. And that's the whole image. And you can see by eye that the distribution is thinner. You know, I asked, I posed the question, what's the Delta? What is the achievement here? You know, it doesn't change the world completely, but it's a huge improvement. And if you work very hard to collect data, why not doing a better job? So we were inspired by it. And, and Ben Hendricks who just submitted his PhD, has done something similar using one million Sloan. And we show there the papers on the archive together with collaborator from Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, who are computer scientists, uh, showing what happens if you only have magnitudes compared to what happens if you have the images. And here, even in a, an attempt by Ben to combine the images and the magnitudes, there is a bit of you know, cross correlation here, but it does seem to improve the mean square error by about a factor of two. So I think there's a lot of scope for that. If people are looking for new directions of looking at full images, and uh, uh, one can do it also uh, for, for the classification, as we've just seen. Final thing uh, is, is an area which I think is somewhat underexplored of, of benchmarking or scalability. The point is, you, normally we compare algorithms, and here there are three algorithms, decision trees, uh, random forests, and uh, extremely randomized trees. Here are three. Usually we look at the mean squared error and we say which of them does better and we can do it as a function of a number of training sets. And in this case, for example, the random forest is doing well. But we also have to look at something else, which is the time it takes. Okay, we're moving into a domain of go going from, you know, thousands to hundreds of millions to billions with Sloan and sorry, with, with LSST, uh, Rubin and, and Euclid. So we have to start thinking about that. And indeed, there is activity called Excalibur in the UK. And we belong to a program called BASE, which is run by a, a Radford Appleton Lab, to, to actually start thinking about the exascale. That's a model, modest feasibility study. The point is that even M, the, the minimum square error looks good. It may be that as you go to higher and higher, uh, uh, more and more training data points, you, you spend too much time on the computer doing it. So you're looking for an optimized uh, way. And we thought that ERT in this case is, is actually a good uh, a compromise between speed and MSE. So that's essentially what I wanted to show. Uh, I picked up, you know, the big question I was trying to ask is really uh, not on whether or not to do machine learning. I think we have to do it. We started long time ago, one may say 30 years ago, but now with deep learning, what is the gain? Do we always gain stuff and at what level? So I showed benchmarking at the end, which is assessing the upscaling to the exascale. I showed deep learning to get photo Z. And at the beginning, I showed uh, the, the, the new paper on actually explaining galaxy morphology. In terms of challenges, I think we want to, to make this delta bigger. We want the deep learning to, to be more influential as much as possible. There's also a question which came up a bit in the panel discussion yesterday about incorporating known physics into the process. You can put symmetries or some astrophysical knowledge, but also you want to get some new physics out, if you like, in a Bayesian way, clear, be clear what are the assumptions and what you get out. But also I'd like to emphasize really this importance of training the next generation of PhD postdocs. All these examples are fantastic. And because in our program, they spend six months in the industry, they come back to us with great ideas. And finally, I remember when I entered the field in the 1990s, I, I read an interesting article in The Economist, and I'm just remembering what it said. I could not find the actual paper, but it said something like, only if you know how to make money without machine learning, you can make money with machine learning. So I can paraphrase it for deep learning. You know, I think one needs the intuition, the physics and experience, but if you know how to do it without, you can offer it do even better with uh, deep learning. Thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you very much, Offer. We have time for very quick questions because we are running a bit out of time. Someone from the audience? If not, we have several uh, on Slack. Um, I picked one um, from Sotiria. Uh, she says, uh, 
An advantage of uh, machine learning photos is, is of course, uh, the improved performance. Uh, however, uh, it's difficult to extrapolate to areas um, without examples in the training set. For example, high redshift objects. Can you comment on that? Yeah, sure. This has been a problem from, from the early days. You know, we know there are weighting schemes. We heard about some and so on. Uh, I, I think personally that some, look, this will remain a problem. Spectroscopy is always behind photometry, right? This is by nature. Uh, and I think one approach would really be to supplement the data to do augmentation uh, with, uh, with simulations. I think simulations are more and more advanced. Of course, you have to handle it with care not to do not to use circular arguments, but this would be my take on this. Thank you very much. I think we should move on, but uh, there are a couple of questions on Slack. I don't know if you can check them out, and uh, it would be nice if you can answer them. Um, sure. Thank you thank very you much, very much again, Ofer. Thanks very much for listening. Yeah.